Thank you. Uh, this is a great opportunity. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And one of the questions I'm curious about hearing an answer from you is what do you think of when you think of North Dakota? Cold, winter, uh, small communities, family lifestyle, agriculture, uh, ancestors who made one-way trips from the old world to the new world. Believe it or not, uh, I believe that North Dakotans and people in this part of the world are actually well suited to make the next journey to colonize the moon and Mars because we have it in us, both ancestrally but also because of our experiences here in North Dakota to make that journey. And I would argue that North Dakota culture is really what we need when we take that next step. And I sort of got involved with this uh, as a farm kid here in North Dakota, and it was in a moment like this when I had a big wow. One of the things we do in North Dakota is you know, raise cattle, and in North Dakota it's very cold, and so if you don't have a heat source for your water, it freezes, and you have to chop water to water your cattle. And when we were doing this, I remember as a kid, my dad and I, we chopped a hole in the ice, and all of a sudden, this is a very cold day, frogs were blebbing up to the surface, and I thought they were dead. But then all of a sudden, they started wiggling. And I thought, wow, now this is weird. And it was from that moment on that I was really inspired to explore uh, our understanding of the potential for life to exist elsewhere in the universe. And to even dig a little deeper and look at places here in North Dakota that can tell us how to do this exploration, whether it's the people or the things that we've built or the technologies we're working on, there's lessons to be learned here in North Dakota. And I took this picture on uh, New Year's Eve last year, and it was probably one of the coldest days of the year, 20 or so below. Uh, I would challenge you to go out to the Fort Lincoln State Park and take a look at the Native American villages that, live, or that exist out there, where people lived in these harsh environments. They were connected to the earth, and they were connected to using the resources around them uh, in a minimalistic way that allowed them to survive in these extreme environments. And it's this kind of thinking and technological development uh, approach that we really need to do uh, when we take steps to the moon or Mars. And it's interesting, there's parallels between uh, the uh, earth lodges in uh, Mandan and what our partners in ESA as well as NASA are, are working on and developing. So it's really quite interesting to see how these technologies are informing the uh, development of future technologies for lunar and Mars exploration. And it's not just uh, the ones that are uh, staying put, it's also those that are uh, movable. Uh, teepees and so on are exploration shelters that we've adapted in polar environments uh, in our exploration of Antarctica. And I would argue that this kind of technology is something that we're gonna need in some other uh, more refined and higher fidelity state for lunar and Mars exploration when we're uh, exploring these worlds. And so why are we exploring these worlds? Well, I'm interested mainly because I'm curious whether or not life existed uh, on, the moon, uh, on Mars or Enceladus or on Europa uh, and to explore the moon for its energy resources and so on. And so we know that life has been on the Earth, it certainly has been on the moon because of the astronauts, but we don't know if it exists elsewhere. And that's probably one of the main tasks that people are going to be engaging in when they explore Mars uh, and colonize this place. And it gets back to uh, the types of people that are going to be involved in doing this. And I would argue that North Dakotans and cultures that existed here when the first peoples were coming from the old world to the new world to settle here, they took advantage of their local resources to, to build facilities and homes, and they didn't have much. The same thing is gonna be true of people that make the trip from Earth to Mars uh, in the next few generations. And so, while this is just an analogy, this is the same kind of experience that people will, will have when they colonize those places. Well, what are they going to, where are they gonna go? What are they gonna look for? Well, for searching for life, we're going to be exploring environments that have evidence of the presence of water, whether it's the past or presence. And believe it or not, on Mars, there's a lot of evidence of ancient liquid water uh, that had uh, uh, dominated the surface at different periods. Right now, there's a lot of ice and glaciers and so on. And in fact, uh, there are features like this esker here that are thought to be remnants of flowing rivers that were ice-walled 
or something very similar to what existed in eastern North Dakota. This di digital elevation module sh uh, model shows where uh, large glaciers were pushing down from Canada and have resurfaced eastern North Dakota. And believe it or not, we, uh, on a couple of different expeditions, went to a couple of different features in the uh, Red River Valley, uh, eskers that are uh, in some places, places very accessible, to explore them and to dig into them and to understand what kind of microbes are there uh, and see how this can inform us for developing missions to explore Mars. And if you want to get a sense for what uh, eastern North Dakota was like, you have to go a little further north. This is a picture we took in Iceland. The ice sheets are massive, but they're not miles and miles thick. Uh, they're, in this case, this one's retreating, but just to give you a sense, this is a bus and about 25 or so snowmobiles. These things are gigantic, uh, and these kinds of features dominated uh, eastern North Dakota, and in some places are also operating on the surface of Mars. But perhaps the most interesting uh, analog environment on Earth that we can really test technologies that's even colder than, our, uh, colder than North Dakota's Antarctica. And uh, the base that I spent some time at was the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station. And it was here that I uh, sort of expressed my North Dakota agricultural experience in growing crops. This is what crop growth is gonna look like on the moon or Mars. It's not gonna be initially grown in soils, it's gonna be hydroponic. So, for those of you who are interested in getting involved, hydroponic growth systems is probably the, going to be the technologies that will be used to feed the people uh, in these harsh environments of, of the moon and Mars. And another interesting thing about not just agriculture, but sort of linked to it, is the technology that is needed in, uh, in these exploration environments. Uh, this is a South Pole Traverse, where there was a large number of tractors dragging supplies from McMurdo Base to South Pole so that we could stay warm. And believe it or not, uh, the tractors that were used uh, in this um, uh, area were built in Fargo. These are large quadratracks that uh, are North Dakota technology. And I would invite ent entrepreneurs to work with the companies that are developing these technologies to adapt them for use for flight in lunar and Mars applications. That sounds wild, but it's heavy technology like this that we're going to need. And not just heavy technology, we're going to also need spacesuits. And believe it or not, University of North Dakota right now is leading the way in many different aspects of human space exploration. This is a flight suit, uh, it is a prototype, but it is something developed and designed by students and teachers at University of North Dakota uh, for uh, subjects to wear during flight applications. This is something that would be worn when you're launching or re-entering the Earth. And we actually tested this thing under a launch profile that simulates a, uh, a rocket leaving the Earth and then a rocket coming back to Earth. And it worked, it stayed pressurized. It was a really interesting experience to see something from North Dakota tested in a NASA centrifuge and then it worked. And this is direct space applications. Well, not just spacesuits are needed, but we also need a place to live. This is what a home on the moon or Mars might look like. It's a modular approach. It, it contains modules that would be individually sent to the surface that you're exploring and then assembled on site. It contains a variety of components, which include a habitat, an exercise module, a place to do a work with rocks, uh, an EVA room, and we're all familiar with this in North Dakota. We don't call it an EVA room, we call it a mud room, right? It's that part of your home that you reserve for coats and boots and mud and dirt and all that stuff. That's what an EVA room is. And there's another example how you already know what it takes to live in one of these. Also, we have a plant growth module and we have a rover uh, that is being developed as well. In fact, this was notional a few years ago, but as of today, uh, we're actually getting closer to completely constructing this thing. Uh, again, this is a facility that is designed to train people how to live and work in these isolated and confined environments. This is literally going to be a small base that's like a very tiny town uh, that people will be uh, exercising, growing plants, and then leaving the habitat to go do work outside. And in some of the initial uh, tests that we've done have demonstrated that people can interact with the spacesuits and the rover and the tunnels that go between the different uh, uh, modules. Is, and it's very interesting that most of the people that are involved in this really enjoy it because it gives you a sense for what it's like 
to live and work in these very uh, unusual environments. And again, this is in Grand Forks. Uh, it's not something that is in a desert. So we're testing it in North Dakota first, and one of the features that I'm really interested in is being able to have people go outside and do work in frozen cold conditions. There's no other uh, habitat that's like this because this one is actually partially pressurizable. So it adds an uh, element of fidelity that is even uh, more space-like as compared to other unpressurized habitats. This is what the rover looks like. You can see that it has a small docking port that allows the people to transfer between the habitat into the rover. And you notice that there's a couple of spacesuits hanging on the outside. This is kind of like a mobile mud room. Uh, I like to think of this as a mobile dust room because it's not mud that's going to be a problem on the Moon and Mars. It's going to be dust. And if you figure out a way to manage the dust, you're going to have a healthier lifestyle. And so people crawl through a port uh, inside the module or inside the uh, the rover to get inside of the, the spacesuits, and then they detach themselves to go do work outside. And again, this is all prototype technology designed to both develop the tools and, and techniques and to train the people on how to live and work in these unusual environments. But we're taking it a step further with the higher fidelity spacesuit technology that's being developed. This is the NDX-1. In fact, there's one, of, one very similar to this that's on display here in the Heritage Center. This thing was tested recently in uh, the Kennedy Space Center in the lunar regolith bin to see how the person using the spacesuit would interact with a very dusty environment. So we're starting to think ahead here. We've also tested this spacesuit in some of the uh, most interesting geologic formations on Earth, this being the Western Pilbara of Australia. These, this area contains the most ancient fossils on Earth. And the reason why we're interested in that is because we want to know if a suited explorer, if they're on Mars, if they're going to be able to even see a fossil that has evidence of life in it. And so we tested that uh, in the Pilbara with, with uh, spacesuit subjects looking for, this is a modern day equivalent of ancient fossilized stromatolites. Very interesting opportunity. But we've, we've also done uh, more than just spacesuit testing. We've demonstrated operations to drill and collect samples from the subsurface. This is a, a demonstration of the spacesuit from Uni University of North Dakota in Antarctica, where we were collecting samples and using a drill to dig into the subsurface to collect samples of ice-rich rock to be able to look for microbes uh, in those soil samples. And drilling is something that we are very interested in, not just with human explorers, but we're also interested in robotically. We went to the Atacama Desert a few months ago and tested a small rover that's designed to robotically drill about a meter in the subsurface. And uh, it's a very interesting device that, and you can see the drill string here, has the capability, much like a, a jackhammer or a, a impact drill, to penetrate even rocks uh, and hard subsurface material to pull up samples that can then be aliquoted to different instrumentation that will look for signs of past life, whether it's amino acids or other kinds of biosignatures. This prototype rover is one that we're trying to develop to look for evidence of past life on Mars. But I would argue that a device like this, uh, as functional and interesting and useful as it may be, we're gonna actually have to go a lot deeper than a meter. We will learn a great deal uh, about Mars if we can deploy a rover like this but we're gonna to have to go perhaps 500 feet, maybe 1,000 feet, maybe even a mile, because recently we've discovered on Mars, uh, our European colleagues have discovered a, a subsurface liquid water lake that exists in the South Pole region of Mars. We have no idea what the extent or what's in it, but there's a signature from a geophysical survey that has just revealed this, and so we're going to have to rely on people and technologies that know how to go very deep into the subsurface. And I would argue that even here in North Dakota, there are technologies and approaches and operational capabilities that we should work on adapting for lunar and Mars exploration. And it would be the type of technologies uh, that we're using in the Bakken right now that would be very useful. And on that same token, we see, of course, the flares. Uh, North Dakotans are really good at terraforming. We've terraformed a huge amount of the state into an agricultural landscape, and we're terraforming the atmosphere as well by releasing huge amounts of CO2 and, and methane and so on. And I would argue that even though that might not be good for the, the, the Earth, 
That might be just what the doctor ordered for Mars if we want to warm Mars up to be able to have it be somewhat habitable like Earth. So these kinds of technologies are exactly what we will need on Mars to make it more habitable. And just as an aside, uh, there are other places in the solar system that have huge reserves of hydrocarbons. Titan, this moon of Saturn, is shrouded in a nitrogen-rich uh, atmosphere, but on its surface are lakes and seas of pure liquid methane and ethane. So I would challenge uh, the energy sector to consider uh, extraction techniques on this place, uh, if that could ever be warranted somewhere down the road. So if we were to summarize then our, uh, the story here is that if we were to really envision uh, humans on Mars, it's going to take a collection of a variety of techniques and tools, operational approaches, people and culture to be able to make this journey to the new world. And I would say if we're going to really take it to the next level, where we're going to level up and enable humans to actually colonize the moon or Mars, we're going to have to look within both to our, ourselves here in North Dakota, but also the companies and the entrepreneurial spirit that is required to be able to do this. It's not just people that will make this happen. It will also be businesses because we need a culture and ecosystem similar to what we have on Earth uh, to operate on Mars. And so with that in mind, I simply would like to uh, make a call to everybody. If you're interested in this, I would invite you to allow yourself to be inspired by space exploration. And if you are curious about this, to reach out to NASA, to reach out to myself or others who are involved and uh, share with us your ex expertise and experiences because you might uh, know something or be aware of something that would be useful for us that we haven't thought of yet. And so with that, I'd like to finish and just say uh, thank you for your attention and we need North Dakota culture in space. <laughs> <laughs>